So, last week, we started a, a new Bible study, and I told you it's, it's going to take us probably most of the summer. It's not going to go fast. Uh, and it's on a topic of free will. And for you who were here last week, I had a whole bunch of quotes about free will, and I found just a couple more. And so if you were to just to Google on the internet, quotes about free will, everybody talks about free will. Everybody has their own opinion about what human beings are capable of and what we're not capable of. Here's a couple more I found this week. Life is like a game of cards. Ever heard that? Mm -hmm. Here's how this person explains that. The hand that is dealt to you is determinism. The way you play it is free will. So what I noticed, this is what a lot of people try to do. It's got to be kind of a little of both, right? So you're dealt a certain hand, that's determinism, that's out of your hands. Oh, but now you've got you to do the right things with it. It's up to you, kind of like a 50-50 split. Right? We must believe in free will. We have no choice. <laughs> I don't know if that person was saying that ironically or not, but it must be pretty famous. Right? We have to have free will. We have no choice. Obviously, there's a contradiction there. Just in saying that, Okay. Here's a Christian one that I really liked. So it's Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And Lazarus says, I want you to know that I have chosen life. But that was my decision. Yeah. You just have to put it that way. So when Lazarus walked out of the tomb, do you think he said, Jesus, I choose to accept you? <laughs> now, who was working when Lazarus came out of the tomb? Who did everything? Jesus did. Okay, so this is the kind of things we want to think about. We're not going to finish it in one night. It's going to be a number of times studying the Bible, but we want to see what does the Bible say about free will. Here's just a little review. So I'll spend just a couple minutes talking about what we did last time. We had this, this kind of line here with two sides, and this is really what we're trying to discuss. On one side, it's all God. On one side... It's all people. In the middle is a huge category. I think most human beings would fit somewhere in the middle. Right? Well, maybe we do this much and God does that much. Or God does this much and we do that much. And we're trying to see from the Bible, what does the Bible say? Right? Where on this does the Bible's message fit? If you just go back to these quotes, so like especially this one, the hand that's dealt you with determinism, the way you play it is free will, that person is probably like right here in the middle. Okay? God's, God's doing something. He's giving you the hand you're dealt. But now you've got to use it. You've got to use your own powers and decisions to use it. Right? We want to see what the Bible says. Here's our definition of free will. Okay? A power of the human will by which a person can apply himself to those things that lead to eternal salvation or turn away from the same. And we're emphasizing what we're talking about is a will that's able to, to lead to salvation. So do we have the free will to do the things necessary in order to have eternal salvation? That's what we're talking about. Okay? So we, we did this last time, but we're not talking about free will and things below us. This is how Martin Luther would talk. He said, oh, well, of course, everybody has free will in the things that are below you. Somebody from last week remember what type of things are below you? What you're going to have for dinner. What you're going to eat. Right? What you're going to wear. Right? What we set the temperature at in the fellowship hall. <laughs> right? This is free will. Right? We, we do have the ability in a lot of things. God gives human beings the power in, in things that are below us. Of course, we, we have choices to make. But we're talking about free will and things above us. So, can I, of my own free will, find the way to heaven? Can I, of my own free will, create a relationship between me and God? Can I, of my own free will, take some of the steps necessary to be saved? That's what we're talking about. Alright? So, if ever... You have a discussion with somebody about free will, and they say, well, of course we have free will. I went to McDonald's for lunch. You can say, yes. 
But we're, we're thinking of something different. What are humans able to do when it comes to salvation? Everybody follow that? On board with that? Right? What we're using to, as the basis of our class is a book that was written by Martin Luther. And the book was called The Bondage of the Will. And Martin Luther wrote a ton of stuff in his life. At the end of his life, he said this was one of the things he thought was most worthwhile about what he wrote. And now our, our class, we're, we're not going to go through the whole book. You don't have to read it, but that's going to provide kind of the framework for what we talk about. And in the bondage of the will, it's really a debate between two people. Right? One of them is Martin Luther. Which of those people is Martin Luther? On the left. So Martin Luther, and he wrote this book. Martin Luther was responding to another person of his day. Who was this guy? Anybody remember what his name was? No. Erasmus. Oh. Erasmus. Right? And so this whole book, The Bind of the Will, is really, it's really a debate between these, these two very intelligent people. Okay? Erasmus wrote something first. Martin Luther's responding to it based on the Bible. Okay, we talked a lot about each one last time. I'm just going to remind you of some of the differences. Martin Luther loved God's Word. Everything that he taught and said it needed to be from God's Word. He was a pastor. He was a lot of things. He was a professor, he was a monk, but he was a pastor in that when Martin Luther thought about God's Word, he always thought about how does this impact my people? Right? Whatever it is that God's Word says, how, how does the person I'm preaching to, how do they need to hear this? And faith in Jesus in the heart was always his focus. How do we lead people to eternal salvation through faith in Jesus? On the other hand, Erasmus was peace loving. Erasmus's goal was, how can we get everybody to get along? We've got the Catholic Church, they're doing some crazy things. And we've got Martin Luther, he's saying some other crazy things. How do we just have everybody get along? He was an academic. What do you think I mean by that? He's a scholar. He's a full-time scholar. Full-time, just smart person. Okay, so he's not working with people on a regular basis. He's not a pastor. He, he certainly would have been a Christian, at least he would have called himself a Christian. But he was he was into scholarly things. Okay, remember, somebody remember the one really, really big thing that he did that was very, very useful for the, the world? He translated into Greek. He's close. He didn't translate it into Greek, but he produced the, the best, most up to date Greek version of the New Testament. He looked at all the ancient manuscripts and compiled the, the best possible Greek manuscript of the Bible, which is very helpful. Last, his concern was on outward morals. How do we get people to live good lives? Okay, now just to see these two, maybe in our minds we can think of our world today, and even among Christians, there's differences, isn't there? Differences in what the goal is. Okay, so Martin Luther looked at the Catholic Church of his day and he said, there's this huge problem. They're not teaching people to believe in Jesus. Erasmus looked at the Catholic Church and he said, there's this huge problem. Priests are living immoral lifestyles. And so they both saw problems, but they were looking in different areas. Luther at the heart. Erasmus said, how do we get people to live the right way? So, what we're going to do in our class is we're going to look at questions that were raised in their debate. And so what are questions that Erasmus raises that Luther responds to? And we're going to find that these are questions that are all practical for us today. Last time we just made it through one question, because we had all the introductory information. And that was the question, should Christians make assertions? And the answer is yes. Right? Martin Luther said, the Holy Spirit is no skeptic. And the things he has written in our hearts are not doubts or opinions, but assertions, sure, and more certain than sense and life itself. And so God wants Christians to boldly say, this is what the Bible says. So the Christian will make assertions because? We're told to. Who tells us to? The Bible. The Bible tells us to. 
Right? It's been, I think of Romans chapter 10, Paul says, what you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. Right? God wants us to confess boldly. Why else are Christians going to make assertions? Because the Bible's true. Because the Bible's true. Right? If the Bible weren't true, then we'd have to be really careful. But since the Bible is true in God's word, Christians are called on to stand up and testify to the truth. Okay, with, with one caution, what caution do we need to make in making assertions? They need to be based on the Bible. Okay, now I think we can all be honest that often in life our assertions are not so much based on the Bible. Right? This is the right way. This is how it's got to be done. This is what I think. In any area that's not from the Bible, we should be very cautious. Right? We should phrase it like, you know, my opinion is this. But when it's something that God's Word says, you don't have to say, well, maybe, or I think. You can say, this is what the Bible says, and we need to assert this. All right, let's go on to something new. So here's the next question. Is the message of the Bible clear? And you might think, they were talking about this? And the answer is yes. Erasmus divided Christian doctrines into two classes, some we need to know and some we don't. He used Romans 11.33 to argue that much of Scripture isn't clear enough to understand. So when Erasmus wrote his book about free will, he makes a big point of Scripture is often not clear in what it says. And so we have to be careful to say that we know what the Bible really says. Okay, he quotes this verse, Romans 11, 33. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. So you go in the Bible. And he says, look at the Bible says there's so much about God's word that we just can't know. And so we must never say that the Bible's clear. There's so much that we don't understand. He's talking about God, not God's word. Wow, that's an excellent <laughs> observation. Hold that thought for two slides. <laughs> right? But David's already hit at the problem in what he's doing, right? Let's answer this first. Why would Erasmus, a teacher of the Bible, teach that much of the Bible isn't clear? to avoid offending people. And so, and so, so I, I don't want to cause offense to people. Remember, what did Erasmus love? Peace and getting along. And so, for the sake of getting along, let's, let's be in agreement on a few things. But most of it, let's just say, that's okay, it's, it's not clear. Somebody said maybe he, he really didn't understand the Bible, which is absolutely true. Right? And we're going to see why he didn't understand the Bible in, in just a couple minutes. But part of the problem, he, he, he really didn't understand what the message of the Bible was. And maybe just a, a third reason is, if the Bible isn't clear, what do I have the freedom to do? Make it say what I want it to say. And this is constantly a temptation for all of us. Right? To... to how often are we tempted to take passages of God's Word and well, I want it to say this, and I want it to be against that. And the more uncertainty we can put into the Bible, the more we have the, the ability to just kind of make it what we want it to be. Right? The old theologians would say that sometimes people treat the Bible like a wax nose. You ever heard that? So, just imagine you had a wax nose. What would you do with it? You'd mold it and tell everyone to like it. You said they before plastic surgery, but that's how they would talk. They would talk like, well, you just, you just treat, maybe we would say, you're treating the Bible like plastic surgery. Right? Let's just make it whatever we want it to be. Mold it and make it fit. And so Erasmus, in his book about free will, makes a big point. The Bible is not clear enough for us to decide this. Right? Follow that? Let's look at these statements. 
That's just your interpretation. We can agree to disagree. All that really matters are the fundamental teachings of the Bible. Have you heard these before? Right? Maybe all of them? Let's take a little break. There we go. What are all of these essentially saying? How about to this question, is the message of the Bible clear? What are those statements? What's their answer? Yeah. No, I just think these are such common things for people to say. When somebody when you say something from the Bible and they say that's just your interpretation. What are they saying? Well, the Bible's not clear. Right? We, we can't be sure about that. Or I don't agree with that. Or I don't agree with it. That's it's really what they're saying. But they're saying it shouldn't really matter. Right? So this this is such a concept today. Why do Christians today seek to make the Bible unclear and difficult to interpret? So we can make it up to what we want. So we can make it what we want it to be. Yeah. And it kind of goes to free will, right? Free will, even with God's word. I should be able to take God's word and make it say what I want it to say. And again, like you said, so that we don't feel bad. And if we take God's word as it really is, what does God's word always do to us? It convicts us of our sins. That's what it's supposed to do. But if we kind of, you know, twist it and make it soft, and, then maybe I don't have to feel bad. Okay, so this is a danger today. Just, just watch for this. Of course, this is within Christianity. We're not thinking about opponents. We're thinking of people within Christianity. Is the Bible clear? This is a really important thing. Who's really behind all this? Satan. Satan. What, what are Satan's first words to Eve in the Garden of Eden? Did God really say? Did God really say? Right? Is, was God's command to you really that clear? Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it's open to interpretation. Maybe we can look at Satan's behind all this. He's always doing whatever he can to undermine God's word. We're going to first look at some of the things Martin Luther said, and then, then we'll get into the Bible. Here was his response. He says, Christ has opened our understanding that we might understand the scriptures, and the gospel is preached to every creature. Is the Bible unclear? No. Who is it who makes it clear to us? Christ. Christ. Jesus makes God's word clear to us. He says, I certainly grant that many passages in the scriptures are obscure and hard to elucidate, but that's due not to the exalted nature of their subject, but to our own linguistic and grammatical ignorance. It does not in any way prevent our knowing all the contents of scripture. So according to Luther, if a passage of the Bible seems unclear, what's the problem? Us. Okay, now do you notice a difference? So Erasmus reads the Bible and he finds a passage that seems unclear. And what does he say? The problem is with the Bible. Okay, Martin Luther reads a passage and he admits the other passages that are kind of difficult. But the problem is with us. You know, if I had better language skills... If I had better grammar skills, if I had more faith from the Holy Spirit, I'd probably be able to understand it. Yeah. But the hang-up is on my part. See the difference? Yeah. Well, if you don't know the language, right, then of course it's unclear, but not because of the Bible, it's because of you. It says, what solemn truth can the scripture still be concealing? Now that the seals are broken, the stone rolled away from the tomb, and that greatest of all mysteries brought to light, that Christ, God's Son, became man, that God is three in one, that Christ suffered for us and will reign forever. Are not these things known and sung in the streets? So Luther says there's no doubt about the content of Scripture. What's the content of Scripture? Jesus. The content of Scripture is... Jesus, that God became a man, that he suffered for us, that he reigns forever. And that message is so clear that who knows it? 
Everybody, people sing about it in the streets. I don't know that that happens today that much. I am singing Christian songs in the streets, but you can imagine. In those days, it did. Even children know it, right? If you ask a child, what's the Bible about? Could a child give you the right answer? Christmas carols were sung in the streets. There there you go. Christmas carols are sung in the streets. Okay, and so is the Bible clear? What Luther says is, there's some passages that are difficult to understand because of our understanding. But the Bible, its message is crystal clear. It's about Jesus and how Jesus came to save us from our sins. Now earlier, somebody had said, well, maybe Erasmus, even with all of his knowledge, he didn't really understand what the Bible was about. And I said, that was right. When Erasmus read the Bible, what was he missing? Jesus. If he thought the goal of the Bible was to get people to live good moral lives, he didn't understand the Bible. Maybe he understood what the individual words meant, but he was missing the whole point of the Bible. And if you don't see Christ, you're not going to understand what you read. Right? So I said, let's let's actually look at some of these passages. So Romans 11, 33 to 36. This is the verse that Erasmus used to say the Bible is so unclear. So Romans is in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. chapter 11, starting with verse 33. Okay, so we're going to do something we're going to be doing a lot in this class is Erasmus uses lots of Bible passages, and what we need to do is decide whether he's using them correctly, according to what the Bible really is saying. He says, these verses tell us that God's word is unclear. Here's Romans 11, 33. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond the tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. That's what the Bible says. So is the message of those four verses, the Bible is unclear, and we shouldn't try to understand what it's saying. Is that the message of those verses? Nada pointed out something really important. Are these verses talking about the Bible? They're not talking about the Bible at all. Who are they talking about? They're talking about God. Now, do we human beings know everything about God? No. No. Are there things that God does or parts of who God is that are hard for us to understand? Yes. Absolutely. Right? There's so many things that God's hidden from us. Okay? But is that the same as God's Word? In contrast to the things God's hidden from us, what is God's Word? This is what he's actually revealed to us. And so this passage is actually saying the opposite of what this man is trying to make it say. It's not saying God's word is unclear. It's saying God is so great and so unfathomable, we must praise him. He's so much above us. The only way we can know God is through through the word. Okay, so don't let someone use this passage to say, well, the Bible is unclear. No, God is amazing. And God is so beyond our comprehension. And if ever you get to the point where you think, yeah, I got God all figured out, then read Romans 11, verse 33, because you don't have God all figured out. But it's not talking about how unclear God's word is. No, in contrast, God makes himself known to us through his word. Understand that? Here's a couple other places for us to read. To emphasize this. So one of each of these passages tell us about the clear message of Scripture. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
verse 14. If you're in Romans, you got to go forward in the Bible. 2 Timothy is one of the little letters. There's those five letters in the Romans that start with T. First and second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy, Titus. So second Timothy chapter three. Here's one place where the Apostle Paul talks about the Bible. And we're going to see he's not going to describe it as being unclear. In fact, he's going to say the opposite. All right, so 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting with verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so Paul says, You know, the Bible is pretty unclear. No, that's not what he says. What does he say about the scriptures? What are some of the phrases in that? All scripture is God breathed. Who does it come from? God himself. What is scripture useful for? Teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The Bible is so clear and so true that you can use it for all of these purposes. Maybe the phrase that stands out, what is the Bible able to make you wise for? Salvation. Far from being unclear or insufficient, the Bible gives us everything that we need to know about our salvation. Okay, so don't let someone tell you, oh, this isn't clear. The Bible is perfectly clear as, as the Word of God. Right, one other place, Luke 24. So you can go backwards. Back to those Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke 24 is Jesus speaking to his disciples on Easter evening. And Jesus himself is going to talk to them about God's word. So Luke 24, starting with verse 44. So you remember the story, right? Easter evening, Jesus appears with disciples. They're in that locked room. Here's what he says. He said to them, this is what I told you. I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the sons. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father's promise, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So instead of saying, oh, the Bible, that's ah, not so clear. What? Jesus said, oh, go ahead. Would that... Uh Get, uh, to enlighten you, would that be the Holy Spirit coming to them um, and explaining or teaching them? So so the Holy Spirit is the one who works in our hearts and helps us to understand the Word. Here, though, it seems like Jesus himself opened up their minds in some special way. It doesn't mention the Spirit here. We know the I'm Spirit is always at work. I'm going to send you what my Father has Oh, right. Yeah, that last verse. Yep, absolutely. That last verse. Until you have been clothed with the power from on high. Yep, you're right. That last verse is absolutely talking about the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So stay here in Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit's going to come, and then He's going to help you understand all these things. Mm -hmm. Isn't it like uh, what Jesus did with the disciples in Mass? Uh -huh. and open their minds to the Scripture. Right. Okay, so the message of the Scriptures are very clear. Sometimes. Well, always, we human beings need God's help to be able to see what they're saying. But it's not like the scriptures are this jumbled mix of this and that. The message is clear. Do I understand that? 
Okay, so while not every blank of scripture is clear, I don't think I would say message. Passage. While not every passage of scripture is clear, the message of scripture is very clear. Okay, so we're not saying that, well, if you read your Bible, every single thing it says is going to make perfect sense. No, sometimes there's difficult things in the Bible. And we need to read them a whole bunch of times and ask about them and mature in our faith and then read them again. But the message of the Bible doesn't leave us any doubt. Some individual passages are difficult, but the message is clear. We can only pray so we can open our minds. Uh, Excellent. What a prayer know, to say, so that we can understand. Dear Jesus, open my mind. Yeah. Understand your word. Dear Holy Spirit, open up my heart like you did for those disciples. Yeah. To understand what your word is saying. And I bet each one of you could think of things in the Bible that at one point you didn't understand them very well. And now, you know what? You understand them a little better. And maybe right now you can think of things you don't understand very well. <laughs> and one day, maybe you'll understand them better. Maybe that won't be until you get to heaven. Okay, but this is why we, we can confidently share the Bible, because it has such a clear message. God wants all people to know. Ready to move on? Next question. Is it important to know if we have free will? Yes. So, you can answer the question. Here Here's a really ironic thing. Erasmus is certain that the topic of free will is one of the useless doctrines that we can do without. He says it is irreligious, idle, and superfluous to want to know whether our will affects anything in matters pertaining to eternal salvation or whether it is wholly passive under the work of grace. So knowing whether we have a free will or if it's all by God's grace, it's irreligious, idle, and superfluous. And okay, so, why was Erasmus writing a book about free will? So then, it's kind of an ironic thing, but the man writing this book didn't really even care about the topic he was writing about. Okay? He says, you know what, at the end of the day, whether we have free will or not, it doesn't really matter. So the reason he was writing the, the book, then he mentioned it. Why was he writing a book? Because people were telling him, you have to write something against Martin Luther. And this was an area where he thought he could write something worthwhile against Martin Luther. But he didn't, he didn't really care about what he was writing. He said it wasn't really that important. So just one lesson to learn is, is it a good thing not to be concerned about the Bible's teachings? No. One of the things that Martin Luther responded is that if you want to be a, a real student of the Bible, you have to have passion. You have to have passion for the Bible's message. Otherwise, you shouldn't be writing about the Bible. If you don't care what the Bible says, then don't say things about the Bible. If you think it's useless to know a certain teaching in the Bible, then don't write a book about that teaching in the Bible. Right? For, for anybody... To deal with the scriptures, it takes passion. You have to care about what you're talking about. Okay, so Rasmus, you know what? It's pretty useless to know whether we have free will. Here's how Martin Luther responded. He said, this is the hinge on which everything depends. He wrote back and he said, actually, you have hit the most important thing the Bible talks about. So you say that this is, is useless. Well, actually, one good thing you've done is you've got us debating the most important thing. We need, therefore, to have in mind a clear-cut distinction between God's power and ours and God's work and ours if we would live a godly life. It's not irreligious, idle, or superfluous, but in the highest degree wholesome and necessary for a Christian to know whether or not his will has anything to do with matters pertaining to salvation. So why is it important to know whether we have a free will? 
What's all of our goal? Every one of us. What's our ultimate goal? Salvation. Salvation. To be saved. To be in heaven. Right? So why is it important to know whether we have free will? We gotta know how to get there. If the most important thing in life is getting to heaven, then knowing how to get to heaven is the most important thing in life. And so we absolutely need to, how much do I need to do, right? How much depends on me? This is like the hinge on which the whole message of the Bible depends. Every one of us needs to know how much of my salvation is God's work and how much is my work. And I need to know that, so I better be doing my work, right? So that I can make it then. This makes sense? This is an important discussion. How much can people do to, to get to heaven, which is what our goal is? In the section, Luther uses one passage. Luke 10, verse 28. He says, suppose, this is Jesus talking. Jesus said, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? This is one where I don't know if I would have used that passage or thought of that passage. <coughs> but what's Jesus saying in that passage? Before you do something, you should... You should think through what the implications are. You should think through how much effort it's going to take. You should think through whether you have the ability to complete it. Okay, now Jesus was not talking specifically about free will in that passage. But how might that apply to what we're talking about? If I'm going to be a Christian, what do I need to understand? Who does the work? Who does the work? How much is this going to take? Do I have the ability to finish the job? Right? This is important. You see the connection? Okay, so if you and I are going to be Christians, we absolutely need to know, what is this involved? How much of this depends on me? What is God going to do? It's an absolutely vital question for anybody who wants to be a Christian. So why is it important to know if we have free will? What's that? Oh. So that we know the way to salvation. So ultimately, so that we can be in heaven. Good. Can you see how so much of the Bible really hinges on this question? How much do we do and how much does God do? This is important. Any questions for me? So good. So let's let's expand on that a little bit. So we have free will below us. You know what we wear, what we eat, you know even what what kind of house we live in. We have free will to to, to make choices there. But with those things below us that we control, what if we're wise? Will we always do before we decide? We're going to sit down and estimate it out. Okay, so you do you do have the ability, God giving you the resource. Of course, everything comes from God. You have the ability to buy a house. Before you buy a house, what should you do? See if you can afford it. See if you have enough money for it. See if it fits within your resources. Now, if it's important to do that for the things that are under our control, is it more or less important for us to do that with the eternal things that have to do with salvation? More important. Right? Can you just see how that logic works? If, if we spend time planning out the menu for the week for what we're going to eat, shouldn't we plan out how we're going to make it into heaven? If we're going to spend time thinking about what outfit to wear each day, should we spend time thinking about where we're going to spend eternity? Right? And if thinking through the costs involved is beneficial for the small things that are below us, it most certainly is beneficial for those things that are above us. Good point. Here's the next question. Does God foreknow all things? Okay, first we have to have some definitions. What is foreknowledge? Know what's going to happen in the future. Excellent. Knowing what's going to happen in the future. Knowledge of something before it happens. 
Okay, so when we talk about foreknowledge or God's foreknowledge, how much does God know about what happens in the future? Okay, if God foreknows all things, that means that eh, good. He is in, in absolute control of everything. You can phrase this in different ways. Or he knows everything that's going to happen. Okay, that's what it would mean. If God foreknows all things, it means God, before he made the world, he knows how everything's going to turn out. Right? Even those things below you, he knows what you're going to wear tomorrow. He knows what you're going to eat a week from Tuesday for supper. He knows who the next president's going to be. He knows what the temperature's going to be like on Christmas this year. Right? If God foreknows all things, he would know all that. Okay? Luther says, it is then fundamentally necessary and wholesome for Christians to know that God foreknows nothing contingently, but that he foresees purposes and does all things according to his own immutable, inter eternal, and infallible will. Some big words in there. But you're big people. I mean, smart people. Smart people. <laughs> Does Luther say that God foreknows all things? Yes. He has this phrase that he's, he foreknows nothing contingently. If God were to foreknow things contingently, what would that mean? Possibly a different future. Yeah, that it kind of depends on what happens. Right? So, well, well I, I think this will happen, but it depends on what the weather's like. Or it depends on what this person decides. Or it depends on what... So, we have a little bit of foreknowledge, but it's all contingent, right? right? We can guess what the weather's like a week from now, but it's kind of contingent on where the fronts meet up and when the storms start. And, okay? What Luther said, God, for him, nothing is contingent. There's nothing that depends on anybody else. God knows all things according to his immutable, in, unchangeable, eternal, infallible will. It's full control. Damn. This brings up something that God has done where he says he's going to do this. Mm -hmm. And then he doesn't do this. He changes his mind. Mm -hmm. And, for example, uh, we thought this one thing was going to die. And then he says, no, because you changed yourself. Then you will go with me. Yeah. Good. So, there's places in the Bible where God listens to people's prayers and he seems to do something different than what he said he was going to do. Like King Hezekiah. God tells King Hezekiah he's going to die. King Hezekiah prays. God sends Isaiah back and says, well, you're going to live 15 more years. Okay? What? We can't answer all the questions involved in that. But it does apply here that if God foreknows all things, what did God know was going to happen? He knew that Hezekiah was going to pray. And he knew what the result would be. Okay, huh? Is there a, I mean, I get caught up in that whole um, will thing. Is there like a different word in like Greek or Hebrew that means, you know, I mean, free will? Because it's like, well, you have high free will and then low free will. Is there like a different word for that instead of? Because I, I look at free will and I think of, I, my mind only goes to the things I control, yeah. and I never go to the things that God controls, so it totally screws me up when you say, do we have free will or not? Because I can't think that. So is there a different word that God uses in Hebrew? No. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, it says free will. I'm that'd, like, be yeah, a, I can't get that'd be a nice, easy thing, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Just, no, th this is part of the the reason for the discussion and the study. Uh -huh. The problem is the way that we use it. So the term free will, you know, the Bible never says free will. Uh -huh. So the problem is that in every language, human beings have invented this concept of free will. And then we have to, well, what does it apply to and what does it apply to? Okay. Okay, but as far as a will, like the will of God, there's words in every language for God's will, and it means 
God's will. Right? You know, the Lord's Prayer, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. something or say something or whatever it is, accomplish something, but then I stop, and that would be my free will to do it, but I stop and say, would God want me to do that? And there, that's where this, you have free will, but if you think of it in accordance with the Bible or what your teachings of God, you might stop, and there's where you're Excellent. So I, I've kind of warned you, it's going to take us a while to get through all this. <laughs> but what you just said is going to be a very important point we're going to make in the future. That what you are talking about, though, isn't free will. Because what you just described was the Holy Spirit working in your heart. Right? Yes. And so if you and I think of some kind of a bad idea, and we're reminded of God's word and what God says about it, and we're motivated to do something different. Who does that come from? That's the Holy Spirit. So you're absolutely right. Again, we're trying to, to be specific in what we're talking. We're talking about human beings without the Holy Spirit, without God's Word working in our hearts. Can we do those right things just on our own? You see, see the difference? And so we're going to have to have what? Probably a whole class talking about, well, for Christians, absolutely, God, through the Holy Spirit, is working in us good choices and right decisions. We absolutely are able to do that, but that's, that's the Holy Spirit. Does this make sense? Great point. Right? We're almost out of time, but let's, let's look at some passages. So open up to Isaiah. Chapter 46. So for Isaiah, we're going back in the Old Testament. Almost right in the middle of the Bible. Isaiah chapter 46. Bless you. So again, we're finishing up tonight with the question of does God foreknow all things? And we've heard some quotes and thought about ourselves. But what does the Bible say? Isaiah chapter 46, starting with verse 8. God is talking here. He says, remember this. Keep it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things those of long ago, I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. From the east I summon a bird of prey, from a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. Listen to me, you stubborn-hearted, you who are now far from my righteousness. I am bringing my righteousness near, it is not far away, and my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion, my splendor to Israel. God can use some pretty strong language, can't he? What does God say he's able to do? Whatever he pleases. Whatever he pleases. So that thing that, that's still coming in the future that hasn't happened yet, when did God say it was going to happen? From the beginning. From the beginning. And when God says something's going to happen, how many of those things actually happen? All of them. All of them. This is God's claim. God claims every single thing I know and I plan it out. And it's not spur of the moment. It's not contingent based on what people do or don't do. God says, I, I know. Okay? Here's another place. So just turn back to the book of Psalms. Psalm 
Not too far before Isaiah. Psalm 139. Psalm 139, starting with verse 13. So here King David is writing. He's speaking about God. David says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to me. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. So what does King David say about God's foreknowledge? That he knew him from birth no. and to everything that would happen. Excellent. In his life. So you think even when David was in his mother's womb, mm -hmm. God knew him. You could see even in that. He He's knew him the on his head. And he planned out every one of David's days before one of them came to be. According to King David, does God foreknow all things? Yes. Yes. One more verse, Romans 3, verse 4. Paul says, Let God be true and every human being a liar. I've been thinking about that verse a little bit lately. What's that verse saying? Let God be true and every human being a liar. So if every single human being is saying one thing, all eight billion of us, and God says another, who's telling the truth? God. What if it's eight billion to one? <laughs> and what if it's all of us saying something and God says something else? Which one's true? God. God. Let God be true and every human being a liar. And I say, I have to think about that. I mean, it is, we human beings are saying so many things that are totally against God, right? And we're starting to feel like everybody's saying these things. You know, maybe 20 years ago, it didn't feel like everybody was saying those things, but now it seems like everybody is saying those things. The fool says in his heart there is no God. Yeah, the fool says in his heart there is no God. So, if everybody else is saying something and God says something different, who is true and who's a liar? God is true. God is true and every other person's a liar. And it has to be that way. If, finish the sentence. If God didn't foreknow all things, then he wouldn't be God. Then he wouldn't be God. Exactly. If God didn't foreknow all things, then he wouldn't be God. We, we said a lot of prayers at the beginning of class. And you know what we're saying? Even those, those bad things, God knows them. If God didn't know how someone's cancer were going to end up, what wouldn't he be? Good. If God didn't know that people were going to have heart trouble on June 14, 2023, what wouldn't he be? God. Okay, this is the message of the Bible. We have a God so powerful that he really knows everything. And God didn't foreknow all things, so he would be lost. So he would be lost. Exactly. All right, now do you want to go home or do you want to stay like seven more minutes? Seven more minutes. Seven more minutes? <laughs> all right. Because the next question goes right, right into it. Isn't it a bad thing that God foreknows all things? 
So we just established from the Bible, God, God knows everything. Isn't that a bad thing? Here's what Erasmus says. It's good we have Erasmus to present this, this side. What can be more useless than to publish to the world the paradox that all we do is done, not by free will, but a mere necessity? What a floodgate of iniquity would the spread of such news open to the people. What wicked man would have met his life? Who would believe that God loved him? Who would fight against his flesh? See what he's saying? He says, this is, this, is use, this is a bad thing to tell people that God knows what's going to happen. Why does he say that's a bad thing? Look at, look at the second half of the statement. If we pastors go around telling people God knows how everything's going to play out, what are people going to want to do? Change. Change. God knows. Right? It's not up to me. Right? So it's not up to me to repent or confess my sins or to do the right. God knows. It's all, it's all planned out. To Erasmus said, if you go around telling people that God knows everything, nobody's going to do the right thing. Everybody's just going to be off. Nobody's going to follow what God said. Why would anybody repent if God knows all things? Do you see his argument? Right. We seem to get to destination in a way because it's saying, if I'm saved, I'm saved, it doesn't even matter what I do. Right. If someone else is condemned, you know, they're condemned, it doesn't even matter what they do. Right. So we could, we could see him talking about predestination, but remember, what was Erasmus's main main focus? Peace. 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 All right. All right. We talked about multiple main focuses. How about this one? Luther was focused on faith in the heart. What was Erasmus focused on? Outward morals. Didn't we say that? Outward morality. So you're right that you could take his words and apply them to predestination. I don't think Erasmus is really talking about predestination. What he's worried about is, all right, Luther, you tell everybody God's got everything planned out. Nobody's going to want to do good things. Everybody's just going to say, well, God's got to take care of it. Nobody's going to want to repent. Nobody's going to want to change. Why would why would I care one bit about what I do if God's just got it all planned out? We would probably think that the bad things that are happening is because it's not what God wants. It's God's fault, right? I mean, even if I do something wrong, who can I blame? God, yeah. Well, I mean, my sin is really God's. He knows everything, right? So you can see his concern. So Rasmus says, even if God were to know everything, don't tell people that. Because then they're going to be bad. We don't want bad people. So don't tell people that God foreknows all things. Okay? we gotta, we got to answer this before we can go. It might take more than seven minutes. We'll see. Romans chapter 6. We're going to first look in the Bible. So there's this concern. If people believe this or people hear this, they're not going to do the right thing. In the Bible, the Apostle Paul talks about this very thing. So Romans, again, we're back in the New Testament, after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. And notice what Paul talks about. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Okay, can you guess what people in Paul's day were saying? Oh, I'm saved by God's grace, so let's go out and sin. In fact, the more I sin, the more gracious God is. So my sin is a good thing because it makes God look even more gracious. So let's keep on sinning. Listen to what Paul says. Verse 2, by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live it any longer? Don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. What is it that leads people to live Christian lives? Love for Christ. And in order for me to have love for Christ, I need to have a new life. How do I get a new life? According to these verses. I need to be baptized. 
And my baptism, it's like being put to death with Jesus on the cross and rising from the dead with Jesus. And so what's my motivation to do good things? Is it, well, I don't know how the future's going to work out. I better try to do the best I can. Is it, well, I think I've got to earn my way to heaven, so I better try to do lots of good things. What's my motivation for truly doing good things? What Christ has done. What Christ has done. And so if Erasmus is saying, you know what, people are going to be awful people unless you keep from them the knowledge that God knows all things. Where does he think Christian living comes from? Instead of from Christ, he thinks it comes from what do you mean? Do you see the difference? So here's what Luther said. Who will try and reform his life? I reply, nobody. Nobody can. God has no time for your, your practitioners of self-reformation, for they are hypocrites. The elect of pure God will be reformed by the Holy Spirit. Erasmus says, Martin Luther, people around telling people that God knows everything that's going to happen. No one's going to change their life. And Luther says, of course not. Because who can change their life on their own? Nobody can. You're absolutely right. Nobody's going to change their life except by the Holy Spirit. The only way anybody's life is going to change is by the Holy Spirit. Who will believe that God loves him? I reply, nobody. Nobody can. But the elect shall believe it. By the Holy Spirit. And so, wow, well, God knows all things. I see these evil things happening. Who on earth is going to believe that God loves him? Nobody is. Nobody can believe that. What's the only way you can believe that? By the Holy Spirit. Can you see the answer to that question? If we tell people God knows all things, they're just going to go off and do bad things. And, well, of course they are. That's all that we can do. The only thing that's going to change us is Christ's salvation through baptism and the Holy Spirit. Understand that? Right? So any good in us and in our lives comes from God. Comes from God. Comes from the Holy Spirit. Let's stop there. I've kept you long enough. This will be a good place to, to start out next week. Glad you're here. Any last questions that you have? So there was in the New Testament, you mentioned the Nicolaitans, you heard about them in Revelation. There was this idea, well, I'm going to make God look better by sinning more. And that's where the Bible itself answers that by saying, no. Right? If you're really in Christ, you're a new creation, you have a new life. Not get your free will in line, it's God gives you a new will a new life, a new heart, you're going to want to live for Christ. Right? Just, just one closing thought. We'll get to this next time. But this idea that God knows everything. Why does that give us so much comfort? Because he knew what was going to happen from the beginning. What if it's a bad thing? Why does it comfort me to know that God knew even for the bad things? Because even the bad things are perfectly under his control. And when it comes to the bad things, we know what type of a God do we have? Gracious God and a loving God. And so when those bad things happen, what can we be absolutely sure of? God loves me. God forgives me. And the fact that this is under God's complete control, that that's a good thing. Right? Whatever you face this week, it's not by chance. It's not, oops, God didn't plan for that. It's, this is what our gracious God foresaw even before the world started. That would be what's right for you this week. That's what, that's what gives us courage. So who knew from the very beginning that I would, that not where I would be in my station of life Absolutely. on this particular day? And he knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Yep. So what don't you have to do? Pray. God knows. Right? 
practice gives us courage and, and confidence as Christians. Let's go to the prayer. Dear Lord God, these are some deep things for us to talk about. We, we have such a, a, a human definition of free will. We think that we control so much more than we do. It's good for us to think through these questions about the clear message of your word, about how you know everything, and about how that's a good thing because you're our loving and merciful God. Dear Lord God, we, we see tonight how much more we need to learn. Help us to learn all we can from the Bible. This is your true, clear word that you've given to us. And help us as we go tonight to take confidence in knowing that you know all things. Whatever's in store for us this next week, from our perspective, it might be good or bad. It might be fun. It might seem evil. But either way, we know that you're in perfect control and we can put our trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.